277, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, 277. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of the Gospel of John that we read just a few moments ago, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I don't know if you noticed that, but in the second verse, hail the incarnate deity. That's what we're talking about today, is God in the flesh. As you read through the, the verses of the various Christmas carols, you will find immense amounts of excellent theology, especially the older carols that were written 100, 200 years ago, some tremendous theology concerning the Incarnation and all the things that surround that and the glory of God being manifest at the Incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that as we look at John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 18, the two verses, of course, that we pick out of that is the fact that, number one, Jesus Christ is God. That's clear from verses 1 and 2, and he is the creator, that is clear from verse 3. He is the life giver, that is clear from verse 4, and he is the light giver, clear from verse 5, who shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. So we have our Lord Jesus Christ introduced in these first six verses as we move to the witness bearer in verse 6 who is John the Baptist. It's clear that John is not the one who is the light. He is merely a witness to bear witness of the light. And we find that this applies to us as well. Ye are my witnesses, 
our Lord Jesus Christ said. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. But a person who is a witness must know the facts. A person who is a witness must not only have seen what happened, but he must also be able to articulate precisely what happened. In the realm of law, witnesses who have a jumble or a confusion in their facts are not considered reliable witnesses. It's only those witnesses who know the facts to which they are testifying that would be considered reliable in a court of law. John was a witness. He bears clear witness as to who Jesus is and what Jesus would do. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We didn't get that far in our text, but that's verse 29. John knew to whom he was pointing. He knew his role. He knew his responsibility in communicating. He knew the responsibility in preaching the truth about the coming Messiah. You and I must also be clear and articulate as we preach the truth about the Messiah who has come. The one who is God in the flesh. His deity is declared for us in the first two verses. And then we find what is declared of him in verse 14 is the heart of the incarnation. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The heart of the message that you and I must proclaim as witnesses is who is Jesus? Jesus challenged the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And he said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some of you, them think you're Elijah and some of you think you're that prophet. And, you know, different options. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now how important is the Incarnation? Is it really taught in Scripture? Do we find support for it? And if so, do we find it both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? And the answer is yes. Job chapter 19, beginning in verse 23. Job is suffering through a great deal of grief. He has come under Satan's attack in a horrible way. He has miserable friends who are no comforters to him at all, but merely criticize him and tell him that it's his fault. But Job declares in perhaps the earliest book of the Old Testament, a faith that is referred to in the book of James. Job, a man who had suffered greatly, declares his faith in one who will come. Listen to verses 23 through 27 of Job 19. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with a pen of iron and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, now listen to this carefully, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. In my flesh shall I see God. My eyes shall behold and not another. How is this possible? How can we say that someday we shall see God? Especially in light of what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. 
who, speaking of God, it says, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Whom no man hath seen, nor can see. How is it possible for Job to declare with the eye of faith that in his flesh he shall see God? It takes us to the gospel narratives of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 1.26, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, Important to remember that phrase. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what, what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Here we find the beginning of these great promises that Job, with the eye of faith, could look forward to and see. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Do you remember that echo in John 1, and we beheld his glory? The glory is of the only begotten. Here we find it. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for I behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Five times in these two brief portions of Luke 1 and Luke 2, we find David mentioned. That is highly significant because the Apostle Paul explains to us in the four verses of Romans chapter 1, which give to us the gospel, in a nutshell, the importance that the Messiah would be a physical, human descendant of David. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
Now listen to the next phrase. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The one who is God incarnate, he is of the seed of David. It was foretold and promised in the Old Testament scriptures. The Messiah would have to be of the line of David so that he could sit upon David's throne. But he would also have to be the one who was the God of eternity past. The one who had called Israel and formed it into a nation. The one who had spoken to Abraham and given him the covenants. The one who is indeed God come in the flesh. Paul makes that a central part, a central element of the gospel by which we are saved. Who Jesus is, what Jesus did. The key elements of the gospel require both of those parts. Jesus must be both God and man. And as Paul explains here, he was the one who died for our sins and rose from the dead. His death on the cross proves his humanity. His resurrection from the dead, as Paul explains here in verse 4, is the declaration that he is the Son of God with power, which he declared by his resurrection from the dead. Christmas gives us the picture of what God was going to do for our salvation. God became flesh and dwelt among us. John picks up that theme in 1 John chapter 1. And in verse 1 through 4 he says, That which was from the beginning. That takes you back to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. That brings us back to Job. My eyes will see him. In this flesh I will see God at the latter day standing upon the earth. Literal fulfillment of prophetic truth. And John in John 1 1 says, 1 John 1 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have seen, heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, that, that's to examine closely that word that is used there. This wasn't just a passing glance and you saw a car zip by and then later the police said, Did you see a car zip by? And you say, yeah, and said, was it red? No, I don't know. Was it white? Don't know. Was it black? No, don't know. Uh, who was in it? I don't know. Do you know there are more than one person in it? I don't know. That's not much of a witness. Our, our eyes have seen him, but it says we have looked upon him. We have focused in. This is careful scrutiny. This is studying something under an intense light. They walked with him for three years. They watched everything he did with amazement. And with wonder. That is why we find the gospel narratives describing in detail what Jesus did. We have looked upon. And then he says, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He was not a ghost. He was not a spirit. He was not a phantasm. He was real flesh and blood. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness. <laughs> you know, you and I are witnesses, folks. God called John the Baptist to be a witness back there in that passage we read in John chapter 1. And now we discover that we also, we have seen it, we bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Jesus, in John chapter 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Proston theon, face to face with God, and was God, phrased in such a way that it means by his very nature of being, he was God. The scripture could not be more plain that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. 
And then he goes on, because you see it doesn't stop with the line of the apostles. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now for good or for bad folks, you have received a commission. I have received a commission. You and I have had something entrusted to us, and the question is now what will we do with it? Declare we unto you, because you see, we are an extension of those believers who go back 2,000 years, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This is not an oral tradition that has been handed down to us. This is not somebody's big idea of what they thought ought to have happened. This is the writing of one who saw, who examined carefully, who touched and knew that he was real human being. The one who is the word who was from the beginning. What will you do with what God has entrusted to you? His Christmas gift to you. Ha ha. What a magnificent gift. No one ever gave a greater gift. No one even gave a semi-comparable gift to what God has given us when he gave us his son. But we have a warning. Three chapters later in chapter 4, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, it says, and here is a very important point because you will face this if you have not already faced it multiple times. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now listen to what it says about the incarnation in verses 2 and 3. Hereby ye know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Dear people, there are those who deny that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Oh, we think of folks like the Jehovah's Witnesses and others who specifically articulate they don't believe that. But all around you, you find people who think of Christmas as a pretty little story about a pretty little baby in a pretty little manger a long time ago so that we can pig out on Christmas Day and give gifts and hope that we get something better than they gave us. Dear people, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Everyone who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Everyone that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. The incarnation is a point of watershed just like the cross is a point of watershed. Just like the resurrection is a point of watershed. Just like creation is a point of watershed. The incarnation is a major point of watershed. They fall on this side or they fall on that side. Everyone that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. We move to Philippians chapter 2. Oh, what a magnificent passage this is because our salvation, our redemption is based on the incarnation. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There is his deity proclaimed clearly. He is the co-equal with Father and Spirit. He is the one who is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. All of the immutable attributes that can be given to God or said of God belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7, here's the incarnation. But made himself of no reputation, 
and took upon him the form of a servant. That tells you what men were made to be, servants. And you are, whether you like it or not, a servant. Either you are a servant of God, or you are a servant of the devil. Either you are a servant to divine righteousness, or you are a servant of sin and wickedness and the flesh. You have no choice as to whether or not you will be a servant. It is a question of whom will you serve? Jesus Christ took on the form of a servant. That is, he took on humanity and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross you see, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no sending away of sin. God, to save us, what a worthless bunch of things to save. God, to save us and to fulfill his own divine righteousness and law, which required the shedding of blood for sin, came to earth and took on human flesh that he might shed his blood for us. That's the story of Christmas. That's the story of the incarnation. God in the flesh. And here we find the reason. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But not only did he take on flesh so that he might redeem us, that he might give us everlasting life so that he might be ultimately exalted. We discover in the book of Hebrews there was another reason for the incarnation as well. Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That's the incarnation that is being referred to here in verse 14. And notice why and what the purpose of the death of Christ is in this verse. He had to become a man that he could die. And here is another one of the reasons that God gives to us for the death of Christ. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He is a genuine, literal, physical descendant of both David and Abraham through the Virgin Mary. He took on him a specific line of human seed. Because the promises were made to Abraham. The promises were made to David concerning the one who would come as Messiah and sit upon his throne. He had to be incarnate and he had to be from that line. But he could not save anyone if he were not God. For only God can give eternal life. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That is the incarnation. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. The Apostle Paul gives us the great truth of the Incarnation in a beautiful doxology, I think something that probably was sung 
in the early church as he writes to First Timothy, uh, to Timothy in First Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now listen to this next phrase. God was manifest in the flesh. You cannot state the incarnation any more succinctly, any more precisely than that. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. God was manifest in the flesh. Paul gives us another insight. Oh, an incredible insight concerning the incarnation. Something perhaps you've never thought about before. Something that blows your mind when you begin to, to look at it. Something that is expressed in many of the Christmas carols. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. When we consider Christ, oh, if it doesn't fill our hearts with thanksgiving, we are dead, dead, dead people. Abounding, as you consider Christ, Jesus our Lord, abounding in thanksgiving. Then he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He's giving us a warning here, just like John did in 1 John chapter 4. Now verse 9, here is our key verse. For in him, that is, in Christ, dwelleth all not some, not most, not squeezing out at the edges. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Does that blow your mind? It should. We are talking about the infinite, omnipresent God. No matter where you go in the farthest expanse of the universe, God is there. David says, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. We're talking about the God who created everything and who is everywhere within his created universe and he exists outside of, apart from, and not sustained by his universe. When you look at the babe in the manger, when you look at the incarnation, in him dwelleth all oh, the fullness, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There is nothing that God is that Jesus isn't. Everything about God all the fullness, not merely of God, but of the Godhead. Special word that is used here to express this ineffable truth. The fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily in Jesus. Dear friends, that's the incarnation. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. God became a man. Because we were sinners, and we were lost, and we were hopeless, and we were guaranteed eternity in hell. But God broke through time and history and space and all that restricts anything or anyone. And God became a man through a specific lineage, a descendant of Adam, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David. And he became a man. What incredible truth that is. No mistakes, no leaks along the way, nothing foiled in the divine plan. 
until we get to Bethlehem, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God in the flesh. Paul tells us that there are different ways in which God has revealed himself. He tells us that God has revealed himself in creation. For the invisible things of him, that is of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. There we go again. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Creation points to Christ, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's why we study science, folks. That's so we can know Jesus better. So that we can know the one who created all things better. So that we can marvel at the intricacies and the, the incredible things that he has done. That reveals something about God. And if you don't study it, you won't know those things. You only have a vague idea. Yeah, he made everything. But you study it because it reveals Jesus. Paul says so in Romans 1. Creation does reveal God, but his greatest revelation is in Jesus Christ at the Incarnation. Did you remember the last verse that I read out of John chapter 1 this morning? Verse 1 tells us that he is God. Verse 14 tells us that he is the word who came in the flesh. That's the incarnation. Remember verse 18. And it answers the question that we asked when we read that passage in Job. When Job says, in my flesh shall I see God. Mine eye shall behold him and not another. Indeed, Job knew of the resurrection. But he's telling us that someday he will see God, whom Paul told Timothy, you know, God who dwells in the light inapproachable, he's invisible, can't be seen, nor will he be seen. So how could this be true? And the answer is verse 18 of John chapter 1. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father hath declared him. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. To see Jesus is to see God. Do you remember Philip's question? Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said unto him, Philip, have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ knew precisely who he was. He was not a man scrambling around for a mission and finally settled on something that he thought sounded pretty cool. He knew who he was. He was the creator God. He was the one who spoke to Abraham. He was the one who spoke to Moses at the burning bush, both in John chapter 8. Philip, when you see me, you see the Father. All that you could ever learn about the Father, I have declared it unto you. I have lived it before you. I have revealed it unto you. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Paul is writing to Timothy about Jesus, the one who is the King. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How do we see the invisible? How do we see the invisible? We have not yet seen him with our eyes. We know what the scripture teaches. We know what Jesus declared. We know what all the apostles bear witness to. What John the Baptist from the Old Testament bore witness to. How do we know? Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, speaking of Moses, he forsook Egypt, that's the world around us, friends, not fearing the wrath of the king, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. For he endured, this is Moses, leaving Egypt with a bunch of rebellious people, crossing the Red Sea, Wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. 
How did he endure it? Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. This is the chapter of heroes of faith. We too are called upon to walk day by day by day by faith. That, dear friends, is the heart of the Reformation. That is the heart of Christmas. That is the heart of the Christian life. That is the heart of the gospel. We trust in Christ by faith. God who became a man, who lived a perfect life among us, who died on Calvary's cross for our sins, who was buried, and then who was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, 4. Have you placed your faith in him? He is the only one who can save you. He is the only one in whom is life and light. And the light was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then he has called you, if you are saved, to be a witness for him too. A witness is articulate in what he proclaims. The witness has to know what he has seen and heard. The witness has to know the facts of the case. Now, dear friends, you are a witness for Jesus in this world. Do you know who he is? Do you know what he's done? And will you, without being pressured by the hoodlum mafia of the world into being silent, will you proclaim that for all you are worth? Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you that the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father hath declared him. How we thank you that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was by his very nature of being God. How we thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Father, you have called us to be witnesses to him. And at this Christmas season especially, to point people to the Christ of scriptures, not merely to a pretty nativity scene. But help them to understand that this is the watershed of God breaking through history to provide redemption for men and to destroy the devil and all of his works. How we thank you, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And how we thank you that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name, amen.